have your Bibles, if you can open them up to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1. And the Lord has put a message on my heart this morning. And I pray that we're blessed. I pray that we're encouraged to continue to be our best for God. Amen? Nehemiah, chapter 1. Right here in verse 2. And it reads like this. It says, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some of the other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. And they said to me, those who have survived the exile are back in the province but are in great trouble and disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And when I heard these things, I sat down and I wept for some days. And I mourned and I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. We just pray that you'll speak to our lives, speak to our hearts. Continue to help us to become all that you called us to be so we could do all that you called us to do, Lord. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we all say, amen. You may be seated. Turn to your neighbor and tell him. This is your moment. And this morning, I want to talk to you about maximizing moments. Maximizing moments. And we all have moments in our lives that we can look back to, we can reference to. In our spiritual walk, some of those moments was the first day we got saved. Some of those moments could be the first time we led somebody to the Lord. Some of those moments could be the first time we discovered our calling and our purpose and the gifts that God has placed inside of us. Some of those moments could be our first answered prayer or our first miracle. There's so many moments in our life, so many moments also in our childhood. I remember growing up, I grew up with a group of friends that were very athletic And every summer we would play basketball, every fall we would play football, every spring we would play baseball. It was almost like growing up on the sandlot. Come on, somebody. (laughs) And we would play these sports. So finally when I got older and I was a freshman in high school, I tried out for the football team. And I went and I signed up. I was all excited. You know, I thought it was almost the same as... Street football. Come on, somebody. And it was my first time signing up for an organized sport. And I remember it was, it, it was, it was, it, it was difficult. And, and the, the mainly what was difficult was remembering the plays. The, the drills weren't so hard. The, 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 the practices weren't so hard. But remembering the plays, that was, that was the challenge. So I remember our first game. And I remember sitting on the sideline, just trying to go through these plays, remember the plays. And just out of the blue, the coach looks at me and he says, all right, you're going in. And he puts me in and he goes, this is the play. See, I don't even remember the play, but he goes, this is the play. He goes, tell the captain this is the play. So I run in, I tell the captain, then... Quarterback takes the ball. I was, on, I was on the defense. Quarterback takes the ball, hands it over to the running back. They do some kind of switch reverse, and I totally missed the tackle. And the coach pulls me out right away. He goes, that was the play. That was the play. I knew they were going to do that. That was the play. What happened? He goes, you missed your moment. You missed your moment. And how many know moments come in our life, most of the time, unexpectedly? Unexpectedly. And you better believe it that I went back to the locker room, studied that book to get ready for my next moment. But moments come when we don't expect them. 
And that's what happened in the life of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. Nehemiah was a governor to the king, Artaxerxes. And what we see is we see that Nehemiah received his moment. And we see that he asked his brother about the remnant. He asked his brother about, you know, his, his people, the people that went back to Jerusalem. And just to give you a little bit of history, what, you, what was taking place is the tribe of Judah for a long time was in exile, over, you know, with the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonian Empire conquered Jerusalem and put them in exile for 70 years. But then the Persian army came in and overtook the Babylonian Empire, and we see that they overtook them. And, and one thing that you see about the Persians is they didn't believe in slavery, so they looked at, the, at God's people and they said, we want you to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild your city, but all you have to do is pay taxes to us. And, and that was one of the requirements. So they went back and they started rebuilding the city and they first focused on the temple, and it wasn't as beautiful as Solomon's temple, you know, you know but, 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 but it, it would do for the moment. So they, would, they were focusing on the temple. They were focusing on building their homes. And what we see is we see that one thing that was lacking were the walls. The walls of Jerusalem were still destroyed. The walls of Jerusalem were still in disgrace. And that's so important for us to understand. These walls were not ordinary walls. These walls were about 13,000 feet high. You know, compared to the people there, they, they, they were high. They, you know, but one thing about the walls is the walls protected Jerusalem because Jerusalem was actually a city on a hill. It was a city on a hill. It, it, it sat on a hill from far away. You could look at Jerusalem, and, and it looks like the entire city's on a hill. So the only thing that it's protected by were the walls. The walls represented Jerusalem's dignity. The walls represented Jerusalem's army. The walls represented Jerusalem's protection. And these walls were important to Jerusalem. These walls were important to God's people. So the city was being rebuilt, but the walls were still destroyed. You know, there's healthy walls. But how many know there's also unhealthy walls? See, healthy walls, they build up, they protect. Healthy walls, they benefit our life and the lives of others. But how many unhealthy walls are not beneficial? They're actually barriers. Unhealthy walls are barriers. And, and one of the best comparisons to an unhealthy wall is the Berlin Wall. That when the Berlin Wall was put up, it was put up to separate communism and capitalism. But you know what it actually did? It actually separated families. Husbands from wives and, 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 and children from their parents and friends from their friends. For almost 30 years, that Berlin Wall was up as a barrier. And it's separated. And how many know that that's, those are the type of walls that the enemy tries to bring in God's house? Walls that, were, that will separate. Walls that would come up and begin to separate us from God's power. and Separate us from God's purpose. And separate us from God's plan. But how many know that we're here to destroy those walls, but we're here to build up some healthy walls? Some walls that will protect our, 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 what God is doing in this place. Some walls that will protect God's purpose for our church. Those are the walls that, 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 that Jerusalem represented. And, and that's why they were in disgrace. And that's why they were discouraged. And that's why they were defeated, you know, you know for that moment. But, but, but there was a man that was ready for his moment. And as Nehemiah received that news and as Nehemiah received that, that, that you know, you know he, he didn't just ask his brothers What's going on? He asked with deep concern. How many know, has ever, anybody ever asked you, you know, how are you doing? No, no, no. How are, how are you doing? With deep concern. That was Nehemiah's concern. He was, he was deeply concerned for his people because the walls were destroyed. 
But there was a moment that came and a, and a moment that approached him that even though he was in a place of success and even though he was governor in the kingdom and even though he was next to the king at the moment, how many know he was ready for his moment? And that's when it comes. It comes when we don't expect. How do you know a moment is a God moment? Is when it benefits the lives of others. That's how you know. That's how you know. And that's when, when we respond. And that's when we, when we take our place. And that's when we put our hands to the plow and say, God, I'm ready. God, you've chosen me. God, this is a moment. And I'm going to maximize this moment for your honor, for your glory. Why? Because it's not just going to benefit what's taking place in my life. It's going to take benefit what's taking place in the lives of others. Because how I many you know that's what God has called us to do? To help others, restore others, rebuild others. Because how many know there's broken walls in the lives of those that God has called us to reach? I think of Pastor Sonny when he started the first church right there on Glass Street. He wasn't thinking of himself. If he was thinking of himself, how many know he would still be preaching? He was still, you know, uh, being the, the, the office of an evangelist at the time. But he said there's a cry. There's walls that are broken down in, in the inner city. There's walls that are broken down on these streets. There are walls that are broken down in the world. And how many know he was ready for his moment? And he didn't just take his moment. How many know he maximized his moment? How do we maximize our moment? Well, number one, with God's power. With God's power. See, in our own strength, we can do some things. But how many know in God's strength, we could do all things? We could do all things. The Bible says we could do all things to Christ who strengthens me. His strength. In our strength, we could do some things. In our strength, we're, 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 you know, we can get so far. But with God, you know, we can experience far more uh, results than we can ever imagine. With God's power. Nehemiah didn't, what, the first thing that Nehemiah did was he prayed. He didn't, he didn't go and say, well, what, what can I do? What, you know, you know, you know, what can, man, how, how can I help? Or, or he said he prayed. He didn't pray for one day. He didn't pray for two days. He didn't pray for one week, for two weeks. Did you know that he actually prayed for four months? For four months, he was praying. And God could have raised somebody up in Jerusalem. God could have, because they were already working. They were already in motion. Things were already moving. So God could have raised somebody up there. At that time, there was a man by the name of Zerubbabel and a, and a priest by the name of Ezra. They were great leaders, and they were there. They were working. They were there in Jerusalem working with the people. And God could have raised somebody up there. But there was a man that relied on God's power. Not on his own abilities, not on his own strength, but the Bible says he prayed for four months. And, and the Bible says that, that during that time of prayer is when he got the king's attention. When you pray and when you're deeply concerned, how many know we're able to get the king's attention? Oh, come on. How I many know our king has all the resources? Our king has everything that we need. He has all the power in order for us to accomplish the task because we serve a big king. We serve a great king. We have access to the king. He knew that. And he began to pray and he began to ask God. So in heaven, as things were working out, then God moved down on the king there on earth, King Artaxerxes. God answered Nehemiah's prayer because it was a courageous prayer. If you want your prayers to be answered, look at the prayer of Nehemiah. It was a prayer of courage, of courage. Oh, he started repenting on behalf of Israel. He started coming before. He, he started pleading to God. It was a courageous prayer. The Bible never said that he was in a place of, uh, of defeat or in a place of sin or, or anything like that. He started pleading on behalf of the people. His heart were, was for the people. How many know when your heart is in the right place, how many know things begin to line up? 
That's when healthy walls begin to rise up. That's when healthy walls begin to build up. When, when our heart is in the right place, it's always important to ask yourself in ministry, why am I doing what I'm doing? It's always important when, you, when God gives you a position, it's, it's asking, God, why am I doing what I'm doing? And how many know that will check our hearts and that will check our motives? And if your motive is to help others and heal others and restore others and benefit others and work with others, you're in the right place and you're getting the attention of the king. It was a prayer of courage. It was a prayer of consistency. Four months he began to pray. Four months he began to seek God's faith. But it was also a prayer of compassion. He began to weep for the people. He began to weep for the people. When was the last time you were before God and, and you were weeping for others? Sometimes we weep for our own circumstance and that's okay. But how many know it's also important to weep for the circumstances of others? That's when God is developing a giant. That's when God is developing a powerful man and a powerful woman of God. He was able to, 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 to use God's power to rebuild the walls. Now, the walls were torn down for over 150 years. When the Babylonian Empire came in, they destroyed everything. They destroyed everything. And over time, things started getting uh, 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 you know, broken down and, and deteriorated there in the city. It was left alone. For 150 years, the walls were destroyed. But with God's power, it only took Nehemiah 52 days. It didn't take him 150 years. It only took him 52 days. How many know? It only took him less than two months to rebuild something. How many know you can only do that with God's power? You can only do that with God's power. But how many know when you're operating in the power of God, how many know it doesn't free us from opposition? And what we see and what we, what we study is we see that, that Nehemiah didn't have one enemy. We know about Sanballat and his army. He didn't just have one enemy. He actually had four enemies. The Samaritans, the Amorites, the Arabs, and the Philistines. We're all against what God was doing there in Jerusalem. But how many know in order to experience the victory, you have to identify the enemy? And sometimes the enemies are inside of us. Sometimes the enemies are inside of our lives. You know, they're not always outward oppositions, but sometimes the limitations come from within. And how many know it's important to recognize the enemies, recognize what stops us? Because, you know, when God calls us and God chooses us, he's going to give you everything that you need. But as soon as we look at our limitations and as soon as we look at our enemies, how many know sometimes that's when fear comes in? And that's where the enemies were trying to come in, the, the Philistines, the Samaritans. And the enemies were trying to come in and bring that opposition and trying to intimidate God's people. But how many know Nehemiah rose up with God's power? He rose up with God's power and he was able to do what God called him to do under God's power. We're able to experience God's presence, but it doesn't always mean we walk with his power. Sometimes in his presence, we feel good. Sometimes in his presence, we feel like, hey, I can do it. Sometimes in his presence, it's like, okay, you know, I, I, I can change. I can grow. I can make this happen. I can do some great things. But as soon as we leave God's presence, what we have is we have his power. We have his power because you won't always experience his presence. How many know when you're under God's presence, it's a good feeling? Oh, you feel peace. You feel joy. You feel like you can do anything. But after God's presence, it's important to walk in his power. Because God's power isn't something you always feel. You only access God's power by faith. By faith. We walk in his power by faith. How many know the Bible says it's not by sight? It's by faith. You won't always feel his presence, but that doesn't mean his power is not with you. You won't always feel that peace, but that doesn't mean his power is not with you. Because the Bible says that greater is he that is in me, that is in me, that is in me, that is in me, than he that is in the world. 
It's inside of you. It's a matter of activating and walking in that power. Nehemiah maximized his moment by walking in God's power. But number two, he walked in God's provision. He walked in God's provision. See, we don't preach a prosperity gospel. But also we don't preach a poverty gospel. How many know we preach a provision gospel? Because how many know we serve a provider? And the Bible says that when he was in the presence of the king, he got the king's attention. Because he, his continent, he was defeated. His continent looks like he was defeated in the presence of the king. And this was important. Because in the presence of King Artaxerxes, his reference point to the last person that was like that in a king's presence was actually the cupbearer to his father. The cupbearer to King Artaxerxes' father came in one day with his continents down, and that's when the king was actually poisoned. So that was his reference. So if that was his reference that, hey, my father was taken out by a cupbearer, and he sees Nehemiah with his continents down, what do you think the king is thinking? But because the king trusted, and that's the key, he trusted Nehemiah, he said, what's wrong and what is it that you need? It's the same thing with our king. God's provision comes to those he can trust. God's provision comes to those where the Bible says when we're Faithful in the little, we can be put over much more. The king, the blessings flow from the king to those that he trusts. And that's what you see in the life of Nehemiah. You see trust. And you see that the king was able to trust him. So even though there was a, a, a negative reference point that he had, he bypassed that and he looked at Nehemiah and said, what is it that you need? God's provision will always follow the mission. God's provision will always follow the mission. See, we're, we're building three kingdoms. Either we're, we're building God's kingdom, our kingdom, or the kingdom of darkness. There's only three kingdoms. We're either building God's kingdom but then what about on Monday? What about on Tuesday? What about on Wednesday? What about on payday? Come on, somebody. There's only three kingdoms. And how many know God is raising up a church that is building the kingdom of God? And how many know God is raising up a people that are putting their hands to the plow? And how many know God is raising us up for such a time as this to build his kingdom? We don't build our own kingdom. We're not. See, did you know that everything that the king gave to Nehemiah, he actually could have built his own kingdom? Nehemiah was, received all the permits, all the resources, all the finances, all the time off. He didn't give him a few days off. He actually gave him a few years off. He was a governor. He was a high official. The king needed Nehemiah, but he gave him years off. Sometimes we're worried about the time off. How many know the king's going to take care of it? Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. Don't worry about it. It's in the king's hands. He gave him everything that he needed in order to build the walls. But everything that he received from the king, did he know he actually could have built his own kingdom? As a matter of fact, the king also gave him a small army and a remnant of people that were still there in exile. So he had people, he had resources, he had finances. On his way to Jerusalem, that's a long journey. So he could have took a pit stop and said, man, this is nice. Why don't we just build here? And I'll be your king. Nehemiah could have did that. He could have built his own kingdom. But how many know we use the king's resources for God's kingdom? How many know the king gives us his resources to build his kingdom? 
Come on, how many know we're in kingdom business? It's not just exclusive to one person or just to the leadership. How many know we're all building the kingdom of God together? We all have a place in the body. See, Jesus took every single role in the Old Testament. He became priest. He became king. He became shepherd. He became servant. He became judge. He became prophet. Why? So that we can all have a place in the body of Christ. There's equal opportunity for each and every one of us to rise up and build the kingdom of God. What does the Bible say? The kingdom suffered violence. But how many know the violent were taken in by force? Not in our own power. In his power. The king provides for those he can trust. Can the king trust you this morning? Can the king trust you with that promotion? Or is that going to take you away from putting God first? Is that going to take you away from your church attendance? Can the king see sometimes we're tested not by failure but by success? Oh, Nehemiah, he didn't have no resources. He was under every resource that the king had in the palace. He was eating the king's food. He had to because he was a cupbearer. He was living with the king in the king's quarters. Everything Nehemiah had came from the king. So how dare Nehemiah think that he can build his own kingdom? His whole intention was to please his heavenly king, his heavenly father. And as soon as he was given the permits, as soon as he was given the army, as soon as he was given the finances and the resources, he maximized his moment. Maximize his moment. Your moment's going to come. The promotion will come. The raise will come. The the opportunities to start your own business will come. The, The blessings will come. But the blessings are meant to flow through us, not just to us. As soon as the blessing stops here, what happens? The river stops. And it turns into a reservoir. You ever seen a reservoir? Mosquitoes, diseases, a little smelly, right? But you ever been to a river? It's clean. It's pure. Most rivers you could just drink from. They're flowing. The blessings are meant to flow. The blessings are meant to flow. Sometimes we wonder, why am I not getting blessed? Well, it's important to ask yourself, are you being a river or a reservoir? Not just if the king can trust you, because if the king can trust you, that means we're being good stewards. But when the blessings start flowing through us, That means we're allowing fresh waters to flow. And others benefit and others enjoy and others are blessed. Nehemiah maximized his moment through the power of God. Nehemiah maximized his moment through God's provision. But lastly, is Nehemiah maximized his moment with God's people. With God's people. And Matthew, you can go ahead and play. This is so important. When you live a godly life, you will want to be with God's people. It's that simple. When you live a godly life, you will want to be with God's people. It's that simple. When you live a godly life, you will want to be with God's people. It's that simple. But sometimes we make it difficult and challenging. And we allow things to come into our lives and things to interrupt our faith and things to interrupt our minds and intercept. See, there's a lot of distractions in the world. A lot of distractions in the world. A lot of things that want to keep us away. A lot of distractions. Sometimes we got the biggest distraction right here. Come on, somebody. Because this gives us access to the world. And sometimes this is the biggest distraction. Sometimes even in God's house. Come on, somebody. And there's so many distractions that we're fighting, so many distractions that are in front of us. But what we got to do is we got to say, okay, I'm going to live the best life that I can live. I'm going to live a godly life because I want to be with God's people. 
I want to build with God's people. I want to help God's people. I want to bless God's people. And that was the, the mindset and the mentality of Nehemiah. Nehemiah began to partner. He didn't show up and, says, and said, I'm here. You know what Nehemiah did when he showed up to Jerusalem? Even though he had all the resources, he showed up real meek. Real meek. Meekness is strength under control. And he showed up to Jerusalem real meek. He didn't come in real strong and say, okay, we're going to build. Okay, get out of the way. I'm here. How many know you make enemies that way? You don't make friends like that. You don't make partners like that. He could have built a wall, a physical wall between him and the people before they actually build the wall for God's people. We're in the business of restoring walls, not building barriers. So he realized that and he showed up meek. He showed up meek. And the Bible says there was a man by the name of Zerubbabel that was there already with the first group of people. There was a man by the name of Priest Ezra that showed up with the second group of people. Now Nehemiah shows up with, with the third group of people. He was almost like the third wave that showed up. And he shows up and what he begins to do, he begins to partner with the three generations that were already there. He said, we're going to do this together. Naturally, they made him leader. They gave him his place. And he began to serve. You know why? Because he remembered where he came from. At one time, he was serving a king. At one time, he was in the palace. And maybe at one time before he became cupbearer or governor, he was maybe cleaning the restrooms. Who knows? Or maybe he was just serving and waiting on tables. He always kept that servant's heart. That servant's heart to serve others. That it's not about him and his agenda. It's not about him or his position. He came as a servant. He never forgot that. But God told him, that's good. You're a servant. Keep that. But with your other hand, I want you to lift up those tools. Those tools. Use what I've given you. Use your gift. Use your resources. Use your ability. Use your calling and your purpose. How many of those? That's a, that's a powerful combination. Boxers win by powerful combinations. Serving and gifting. Purity and power. Come on, somebody. And that's how he showed up. And that's why the impossible task was made possible. He showed up with that, with the right spirit. He showed up with the right heart. And, and sometimes that's all the adjustment we have to make and say, God, I'm not only called, I not only am gifted, I'm not only, uh, this is not just my moment, but God, you call me to serve your people and, and meet the needs of others and help others become all that you call them to be. That's a life of significance. Someone that's successful, success is for yourself. Someone that's significant is helping others become successful. How many know God's called us to live a life of significance? Come on, how many know God is raising up some Nehemiahs? Come on, how many know God is raising up some powerful men and women of God? Come on, how many know that's the church that God has called us to be, to restore lives, to rebuild lives? Because oh, Come on, come on. God has called us to break barriers and rebuild the walls. This morning as we stand, this is our moment. This is our moment. This is our moment. Our moment to rebuild others, to restore others. 
our moment to not just serve, but use what God has given us to be a deadly combination for the kingdom. Pastor Sonny took his opportunity. Pastor Al, when he was young, in his early 20s, maximized his moment to start the first UTC and is still maximizing his moments today. That means it's in our DNA. It all started with the disciples. Imagine if they didn't maximize their moment. Who would we look to? Imagine if the disciples said, no, I'm okay, I'll, I'll stay in the boat. It's okay, I'll stay in the tax collector's booth. It's okay. But they maximized their moment. And they built a powerful church right there in Jerusalem. Where the population was 200,000, they built a church of 100,000. They maximized their moment. They set a model, they set the pace. And this morning, it's important to ask, am I maximizing my moment? What type of walls am I building? Barriers are beneficial. Can the king trust me with all the resources? Am I using my deadly combination, serving and gifting? This is our moment. And right there where you're at, I just want you to lift up your hands and close your eyes and we're going to talk to the Lord. And whatever adjustments, whatever opportunity, whatever needs to change, this is a, a beautiful opportunity to make the adjustment, make the change. So right there where you're at, I want you to begin to talk to God. He's your king. He's your king. We have access to the king. We don't have to go through anybody. We have direct access to the king. So this morning, I want you to share with the king what is it that you need.